And uh, now we're going to move to Radia, to the next speaker. Hi, Anastasia. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, Everybody? Yes, let me know. Yeah. Let me try to share my screen. screen. All right. Uh, oops. What happened here? All right. Uh, hold on. Can you? All right. So, um, you ready? All right, so our next speaker is Radia Bugajal from Argon. She's going to tell us about angedness subtraction with subleading power corrections. Thank you very much, Anastasia, and thanks to the organizers for this uh, kind invitation. So yes, I'll be talking about um, the angedness subtraction method. Um, it's a method to calculate high precision predictions. And I will be particularly discussing recent uh, updates with it to improve its numerical stability, which come under the name power corrections. Okay, so very quick um, motivation. Why are we talking about precise predictions? The reason is that our data collected by the NHC, the, its precision has been improving very quickly. So this is just a selection of uh, measurements done by, by the NHC that shows you um, uh, the precision, the level of precision they have achieved. The ZPT spectrum was mentioned by Gavin already early this morning, uh, where the precision is better than 1%. It's one of our most cleanest measurements that we have right now. Um, there is a large class of diabolism measurements that have achieved an, an experimental measurement of roughly 5%, and this will improve in the, in the future. Uh, for TTBAR, um, what you can see from the inset is various 13 TEV measurements, uh, where for many of them, the precision is comparable with the TD1 shown here in green band. And you can see that at least, at least one of these measurements from ATLAS is already has a better precision than NNLO theory. So, um, some of these measurements are even charging the current NNLO theory precision. So this is again a plot that was made um, in 2019 by Gavin that summarizes um, nicely the progress on the NNLO front. Um, you can see that somewhere between 2015 and now there was an explosion of results thanks to many technical progress that happened. Uh, one of the things that stands out is that we have many uh, two to two results. Most of the important ones have been provided in particular processes with one jet in the final state, which tend to have um, a more complicated infrared stru <coughs> structure. So in comparing with the early years of, of 2000, uh, we've had a lot of progress. So what are the challenges of NNLO? Um, there are many ingredients you need to provide to have a cross-section or prediction at, at this level of precision. And work was ongoing on various uh, parts of it. So you need the double virtual corrections, um, the one of virtual correction with an, with an additional radiation, and the, you need the double uh, re-radiation contributions. And as we know, each of these components has uh, infrared singularities. Um, those singularities, if you are working in dimensional regularization, where you can, uh, where they can appear as poles in epsilon, in the virtual case, pure virtual case, you can integrate inclusively, and therefore you can see them explicitly. But whenever you have re-radiation, uh, those singularities are implicit. So you need a way to extract them. You can't integrate inclusively because you have cats on your final state, usually. Um, so a lot of work went into finding um, a good way of extracting, a simple way of extracting these singularities. And so um, those ideas fall into two categories. One is called subtraction methods, where basically you look for a subtraction term, which is uh, denoted here by sigma, D sigma A. We're looking at the NLO case for simplicity. So those subtraction terms are, uh, they have to approximate the singularities of our irradiation emissions in, in the singular regions, such that this first part here is integrable. Um, at the same time, they have to be simple enough that you can calculate, uh, integrate them over the n plus one part of phase space, and you use the singularities you get from there to cancel the ones from the virtual corrections. So at the NLO level, the picture is very simple, but when you go to the NNLO level, um, this becomes involved. And so uh, there has been a lot of work um, in that direction, and you can see that many, many groups have been uh, contributing to this. Mm -hmm. Now, the second approach, or methods fall into the so-called EFT-assisted methods. And sometimes people refer to them as slicing methods as well. So what you do basically is you introduce a cutoff that isolates the double and resolved singularities from the rest. Because the double and resolved singularities are what characterizes, uh, for example, NNLO uh, calculations. So you separate that complicated uh, structure of, of singularities from the rest, which is supposed to be simpler. And below the cutoff, which is uh, chosen to be very small, there is an effective field theory formula that I will show later that allows you to calculate the cross-section in that region. Above the cutoff, um, there are simpler singularities, 
but they would cor correspond to, you would have at least one resolved jet in that case compared to the born process. And for this region, there are lots of methods that we can already use that have been developed at the NLO level. And so here, there are two methods that fall in this category, the so-called QT subtraction, where your resolution parameter is the QT, the transverse momentum of the final state um, uh, color singlet. It was primarily developed for color singlet. Recently, there are some results for uh, TT bar as well. And then there is the injection subtraction, uh, which I will be discussing in this talk. Okay, so what is this unjetiness, first of all? It's, it's a very simple object. It's an event shape variable which was designed to be to farm state jets. Has a very simple definition which is summarized in this formula here. So basically, first of all, you identify your hard directions. Um, in a typical process, you will have your beam directions. And if you have jets, you also have uh, the jets providing hard direction. Their momenta are, are denoted here by QI. And then this PK are the momenta of any patterns in the final state. Um, QI here is the hardness measure. It's normalization constant. And so you calculate these scalar products with respect to each hard direction, taking into account all your patterns K, and then you pick the minimum of this uh, scalar product. And if you find that the minimum is zero, that means that all your radiation is unresolved. All of it is either soft, double collinear, or triple collinear, et cetera. So that's, that will be this category here. If the unjetiness turns out to be different from zero, which would happen only if one of these scalar products, at least one of these scalar products is different from zero, then you know that you have at least one resolved radiation, hard and well separated from the rest. And this is the area that the region that I said, we know already how uh, there are codes that tell you and that give you these results um, if you wish. So this is just a selection of um, results that show that this method has been successfully used to calculate many processes varying from Higgs plus jet, vector boson plus jet, color single processes, associated production of Higgs, um, diaphoton production, DIS plus jet, and uh, ZZ production. Okay, so let me start um, by talking about the cross section below the cutoff. This is what I said, where I said that there is a formula that gives you that result for small and jettiness. And this formula is actually very small, uh, very simple, sorry. It's um, a convolution of a number of functions that describe um, all sorts of radiations. So you have this hard function which describes your hard radiation. And at the end of the day, this hard function turns out to be the finite part of the virtual corrections. You have two beam functions which describe uh, radiation that is collinear to the beams. Um, initial state beams, and those are universal, which means you calculate them once and for all. There is a soft function that describes your soft radiation, and this is semi-universal in the sense that for all processes with one jet, the soft function is the same. If I add jets, the soft function is going to, to be different, so you have to recalculate it. And you also have jet functions that describe radiation collinear to the uh, final state jets, and those are also universal. You calculate them once and for all. And it's clear that each of these functions has to be available at the right order of perturbation theory you are, you are interested in, and by now, this is, uh, they are all available. And now there are these dot, 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 the ellipses, and those refer to the so-called power corrections. So there are power corrections to this formula. Uh, those are the ones I'm going to be uh, talking about. And so uh, the leading power corrections go like tau cat, times the log to the power of two n minus one of tau cat, where n is the perturbative order. And it's obvious that if you want to minimize them, you have to choose a very small value of tau cat, but there is a trade-off. If you go to very small values of tau cat, the codes that give you this piece above the cutoff become unstable. So you have to be, to strike the right balance, be in the right region basically, if you want to get a result that does not depend on tau cat and that is stable. And so just to show you uh, what I'm talking about, this is a plot um, that we made for Z plus one jet. We are looking at sigma NNLO over sigma NNLO as a function of tau one cat. And you can see that we are looking at a wide spectrum of values of tau cat just to emphasize the point that larger values are not good because you will have clear dependence on tau cat. So you could see that in all these larger values of tau cat, there is a strong dependence on this value. Typically we take our result from this region where there is no dependence on tau cat and those are, this is the region of small values. So you could do better than just relying on small bias of tau cat, very small bias of tau cat, if you understand these power corrections um, analytically, for example, which is what we have been uh, doing recently. Because then you can do, choose larger values of tau cat where you have a better numerical stability. And so we started with the color singlet case um, at NLO uh, for simplicity to understand things. Um, and then we moved to the jet case. So what we have done, we looked at the next reading power contributions at leading log plus next leading log analytically. Um, 
And so this is the definition of my um, angetiness here. And for simplicity, we make the hardness measure scaleless. So we take out um, a factor of two EI, where EIs are these energies corresponding to the beams. And these NIs are just um, light-like vectors. Uh, we show them on the next slide. Um, so for zero jettiness processes, you're looking at a minimum of two quantities, Na dot P3, P3 is the momentum of the Mayuri radiation, and Mb dot P3. And depending on the choice of this row A and row B, you have different definitions of the jettiness, and different definitions impact the power corrections. So in the hadronic definition case, you set row A and row B to one. And so um, this simplifies. In the so-called leptonic definition, where you boost your system to the to a frame where your color singlet is um, at, at rest, this row A and row B depend on the rapidity of your color singlet. So row A is chosen to be one over exponential y, and row B is one over exponential minus y. And we will see later on that these two different definitions uh, will have different um, will give you different dependence on the power corrections. Okay, so. So how did we proceed? We use the so-called expansion by regions. There are three regions you have to consider here, beam A, beam B, and soft region. In each of these regions, the smallest quantity will change. If I am in beam A, tau A is my smallest quantity, which is P3 dot NA. If I am in beam B, tau B is the smallest. And so if I am going to do these expansions, I, I, I ident identify my smallest quantities, um, and so, for example, in the beam A region, we chose the parameterization of our phase space in terms of tau and Z, ZA here. Uh, and the thing to keep in mind about this ZA is that the limit ZA goes to one is a soft one. Uh, so there is a measurement function that is absorbed in here and it simplifies significantly when you are in the beam region, beam regions. In the soft region, tau A and tau B are equally small. The measurement function does not simplify. So there's a different approach that we do there. Uh, it's called the hemisphere and non-hemisphere decomposition. And I will describe it uh, later in more detail in my slides. So what you do, you're expanding your phase space and your matrix elements in the small quantities in each region. And then uh, you're going to add these contributions together. And just to kind of clarify the power counting at NLO, when I say next reading power leading log, those are going to be proportional to log of tau. When I say next reading power, next reading log, those are other one. And so these are the pieces that were missing and they were provided by two groups, as you can see in here. Okay, so for Higgs production uh, at NLO, the, the matrix element squared is very simple. You can write it down and I show it here on the slide. So what you are doing now, you're going to write all your invariants in terms of the smallest quantities in each region. Um, and so for example, if I am in beam A region, my matrix element takes the following form in terms of my parameterization. And so you could see that we have this red box uh, term here. Um, so we use the full matrix element to get this result, but it happens that you can predict some of these terms here from existing theorems. So the leading power in this case is predictable from the uh, leading power collinear limit. And in addition, the ZA going to one limit can be predictable from the soft leading power soft limit. So this term here, the first term is universal. You can predict it. In the next term here, which is highlighted in the blue box, only the first term is predictable from the next leading power. Um, sorry, this is the next leading power leading log term, and that can be predictable from the next leading um, soft limit. The rest of these terms here, you cannot predict them. So you need an explicit calculation. You need a full matrix element calculation for them. So that's what we did. We used the matrix element, the full matrix element on, one, on, on the one hand, and we compared with the results that you can predict for some of these terms. And obviously there was um, agreement. Um, so, all right. So this is the result of the next reading power leading log. Um, cross-section, differential in the jettiness, uh, rapidity of the Higgs, and the uh, invariant mass. And one of the reasons we were studying this is to see if we can make a choice of the hardness measure that minimizes the power correction by looking at these analytic expressions. And this is something that you can see nicely in the zero jettiness case, or in the Higgs production case. You could see that if I choose my hardness measure, rho A, um, to depend on the exponential y, so one over exponential y, I can minimize the impact of these log terms on the power corrections. And this is a nice thing. So you can 
uh, this lesson that you learn from here, you can carry them to the NNLO level. So it's clear here that the best choice would be not to set our A to be, to, to be one, because then these terms are large, but to be dependent on the Higgs rapidity. The other thing that you can see from here is there is a dependence on the derivative of the PDFs uh, that appears. Okay, so just to show you one plot here, uh, we're looking at sigma NLO uh, using the angetiness divided by the one using dipole minus one. So blue is what you get from using the uh, leptonic definition. Red is what you get from using the hadronic definition. And you can see that the leptonic definition does a better job um, in agreeing, for example, with the dipole uh, than the hadronic one. So it's a better choice. So this is including the next reading log power correction that they just um, mentioned. So this was the uh, zero jettiness case. Now we move it to the one jet case. Um, <clears throat> we are looking now at V plus one jet. And one of the things that changes as soon as you add jets is that the definition of tau one uh, will be more involved. In the zero jet case, you just have to look at the minimum of these two scatter products. In the one jet case, you have a new hard direction, which is the jet. And therefore, you have the sum of two minima. Um, one of them uh, relies on taking the scalar product of uh, one of the radiations P3 with all the hard directions, and the other one of P4 with all the hard directions. So you have three times three, which is nine possibilities in this case, as opposed to just two possibilities in the zero jet case. Okay, so what is new with the one jet case? Several things change. First of all, you need to have a pre-clustering jet algorithm to determine the jet direction and jet. Um, so, so far the anti-KT was used, but one question we had is, can you, for example, use the anjetiness itself as a pre-clustering jet algorithm or clustering jet algorithm, and does it simplify life? Um, the soft function right now, in this case, um, could be also calculated in the same approach that we had for the zero jet case, this hemisphere and non-hemisphere, but one question that you, have, you would have is, does the pole structure remain the same or does it change? Uh, we will see that it changes for the one jet case. The matrix elements are clearly more complicated. Um, so what can we say about their factorization properties at NLP? And the final thing is, is there an equivalent to the leptonic definition when you look at the system a bit of boson plus one jet? Okay, so, so the end, uh, most of the processes or all the processes I showed you before, which were calculated using the anjetiness, have used the anti-KT as a pre-clustering jet algorithm. And it works in a way that uh, many of you recognize there's a distance measure that's a three, four square that you have to calculate, which relies on the pseudo rapidity of the jet and the azimuthal angle or difference between the two radiations. And if this distance is greater than the jet cone radius, then the patterns are separate. Um, and so the hardest momentum is the jet. And if it's less than R, the patterns are close. And therefore the momentum of the jet is the sum of the moment of um, the two radiations. Now, what we found is that using the anti-KT jet algorithm complicates the calculation of the power corrections because of these additional constraints it adds to the boundaries. And so we decided to use the anjetiness by itself as a pre-clustering algorithm, and we did find it simplifies life. So let's see how. So this is the definition of uh, the one jetiness, as I showed earlier on. Um, so we start by assuming that P3 is the hardest, and you can get the other region where P4 is the hardest by, by symmetry. So if P3 is the hardest, the next thing you do is you look for the position of P4 in your phase space. So if P4 is closest to NA or NB, then all these scalar products in here, the minimum will be zero from this direction because P3 is uh, by definition or directly going to become your, uh, your jet. Whereas if this P4 is closest to P3, then uh, the jet momentum will become P3 plus P4 and you will have one contribution from this minimum, which is nj dot p3 over rho j, plus the minimum of nj dot p4 over rho j. And so uh, you have three is only to consider as opposed to nine possibilities that we had originally. Okay, so let's talk about the soft hemisphere decomposition. Um, so the thing about the soft region, um, it things are more complicated because um, the measurement function is homogeneous in terms of tau a, tau b, and tau jet, they are all equally small. So you cannot do, you cannot, it doesn't simplify, this measurement function doesn't simplify the way it does for the beam or the jet regions. So uh, one way that was developed for the leading power calculation to deal with it is summarized in this picture. So you have a dependence on three directions, i, j, m, which you can think of as beam A, beam B, and jet. Um, you introduce a partition that extends this white middle line all the way down here 
um, to get you to the second region, meaning that you are in each circle, you have either tau i less than tau j or tau j less than tau i. And you still have a dependence on the direction m. The second step that you do is you introduce a second partition that allows you to integrate it, it, its half circle on, it, on the entire hemisphere, plus a correction factor that corrects for what you have done. And that gives you this fijm and fjim uh, pieces to look at. Now, the interesting thing is that for the leading power case, the poles, all the poles were only sitting in the hemisphere part. And so it's, the calculation gets simplified because in this hemisphere part, you only depend on the directions i and j, not m. And these fijm pieces and fjim pieces are totally finite. And you can integrate them however uh, you want, numerically or analytically. Uh, the fact that they depend on three directions um, doesn't matter at that point. Now, when we move to the next leading power case, we try to use the same decomposition. Um, but at the end of the day, we found that the poles from the soft region did not cancel against the ones from the beam and the jet region. And so we realized we are missing something. So we went back to this non-hemisphere region and we looked at it in details. And it turns out that this non-hemisphere region is not finite for the, for the, for the one jet case. There are poles, soft poles from this uh, contribution here. And so you do have, in that case, to deal with these contributions, which are more complicated. We did that. And then at the end of the day, we managed indeed to cancel poles from the soft region, from the hemisphere and non-hemisphere, against those coming from the beam and the jet regions. OK, so one more thing I wanted to mention here is the fact that um, there are some, uh, we will see that this next reading power contributions, part of it can be uh, predicted by some theorems. So Burnett, Kroll, and Law have derived the subleading soft factorization of the amplitudes in QED, and you can use it in the QCD case by just accounting for the appropriate power factors. And so the formula is very simple. It's, uh, it's shown in here, and it gives you the uh, leading power plus next leading power leading log contributions using only the Born squared amplitudes. You don't need a full matrix element, only the Born squared amplitudes. And so you can use it to extract all the coefficients of the matrix elements in the various regions. And you can compare that with what you have from uh, using the full matrix element and, and expanding in each region uh, using the expansion by regions. OK, so um, that brings me to the next slide. This is the form of the next reading power uh, contributions. They uh, factor into um, a term, which I denoted here as C alpha LL those contributions, the leading log contributions, are universal. Uh, they multiply the log of tau over Q alpha. Alpha here refers to all the regions we have, beam A, beam B, jet, soft hemisphere, and soft non-hemisphere. And then there is the C alpha NLL. Those are uh, process-dependent contributions. So you need the full matrix element square to calculate them, which is what we did. We don't have yet a theorem that allows us to predict them in the in a process-independent way. Um, so these Q alphas depend on what region you are in. Um, so they are all defined um, on the slide here. And in particular, you could see that for the Q jet, there is a dependence on the cosine hyperbolic eta, which is the pseudo rapidity um, of the jet. And I will come back to um, this later. So without a subleading collinear theorem, we cannot predict the next leading uh, log pieces of the NLP part um, in universal mm -hmm. form. All right, so what is the impact of these power corrections? Um, there are two plots here that um, uh, showed the impact of including them in our cross-section. So we're looking at sigma NL over sigma uh, over the, as a function of uh, pseudo rapidity, uh, uh, you know, normalized to some reference or compared to some reference value, which uh, agrees with the devil subtraction result dependent by, uh, divided by the leading order cross-section. Um, the red result has only the leading power contributions, and the blue one has includes also the uh, next leading power, leading log contributions. And we are looking at the QQ bar plus Q bar Q channel. We also have the quaglu one. Um, you can look at it in the paper. So you could see that these power corrections have an impact on improving um, the numerical stability because you could see that you can go to higher values of tau cat. Um, than without these power corrections. And the same is observed on the right plot. We are looking at the cross-section as a function of the PT of the jet. Um, and you can again see that including the power corrections improves uh, uh, 
the agreement with, for example, divulge significantly, you can go to higher values of tau cad again here compared to the leading power case, where you have to stick to uh, smaller values of tau cad. Okay, so let's talk about the normalization choices. So the previous plots that I have showed you were done using the hadronic definition, where rho a, rho b, and rho j are set to one. Um, so in recent work by Campbell et al, they recalculated the Higgs plus jet result at NNLO, which was done previously using the hadronic definition. Now they changed the definition of the unjetness to use the so-called the boosted uh, definition. They boost this entire system Higgs plus jet to a system where this system where this um, Higgs plus jet are at rest. Um, so their choices of rho a, rho b, and rho j are shown in here, in particular, you can see that rho j depends for them both on the pseudo rapidity of the jet and the rapidity of the entire system. Now, if you go back to QJet, you could see that there is no dependence on the rapidity of the entire system. So it's not natural to make a choice for rho j that depends um, on y. So we decided to test a different thing, which is called the minimal definition, where rho j has only a dependence on the pseudo rapidity of the jet. So it's just one over cosine hyperbolic eta. We wanted to see, um, this is the natural choice. If you look at, at the analytic results, we want to see if it gives uh, improvement with respect to the boosted. And the outcome is um, shown in this plot here. Uh, this comparison was done using the anti kt jet algorithms just to match the, uh, the existing results uh, for that particular case. What you can see is that the hadronic definition is the worst whereas the uh, leptonic or the minimal and the boosted ones um, agree nicely and they both do a good job, um, better job than the hadronic definition. So if I go to values of tau cat of one GeV, which is a very large value, we wouldn't use it to get the actual result, but just to compare, you could see that uh, we get improvements from 22% definition to 16 to 15 when you go to the boosted um, and minimal definitions. So the lesson from here is that at NNLO, the best definitions to use are these two, the minimal and the boosted. Okay, so this brings me to the summary of, of the talk. Um, the punchline is basically in the, in the red box. Uh, using NJTNS as a class jet algorithm has, what we have learned is that it simplifies the calculation of the power corrections. Um, the next leading power leading log result can be written in universal form thanks to subleading soft factorization theorem, but we are not yet at the level where we can say the same about the next leading log because we don't have a subleading collinear factorization theorem. So in that case, you still need to use your full matrix element. Um, and we also found that there are definitions that minimize the power corrections. So the, the boosted and the minimal ones would work pretty well when you go to the NNLO uh, level. Thank you. Thank you, Radia. Thank you. Now we have time for questions. Please raise your hand and unmute yourself. If you are... uh, yeah, Lance has a question. Okay. Hi, Radia. Thanks a lot. Hi, how are you? Um, so you showed results about power corrections at NLO. Yes. And you want them at NNLO, right? Right. So, so uh, what's the, the idea of NNLO uh, power corrections. So the idea was to study the power corrections analytically at NNLO to see if we can learn um, something about the hardness measure that minimizes the power corrections and then take that and do it for the NNLO level. Um, so what we have learned from this analytic calculation for NLO is that there are indeed such definitions that are going to minimize the impact of the power corrections, allowing you to choose larger values of tau cat. And you could do that immediately without having to go through the analytic calculation of the power corrections at NNLO. It was actually pretty tough already at the NLO level. So one can try the NNLO, but it's a much longer process to get things analytically at that level. But we did learn something, which is that there are good definitions of the unjettiness that minimizes them. Okay, great. I understand better. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, there's one more qu one question. Please unmute yourself. Gerardo Vita. Hi. Uh, Hi. I was uh, uh, curious about the fact that uh, in, in this comparison actually you're showing, you're using uh, NTKT as a clustering algorithm. Uh, in the calculation, you said that it's uh, simple to use uh, NJTNS as a clustering algorithm, but uh, are the power correction the same, or do you actually get uh, uh, in even like as an order of magnitude something different? 
because it's non-trivial that you can get, uh, for example, uh, non-linear uh, power correction from a different uh, jet clustering algorithm. Exactly. So we use the anti-KT for this comparison because the result uh, of this paper here use the anti-KT jet algorithm. So they don't have the result for the boosted definition with the MJTNS as a clustering jet algorithm. So we had to go and do it with the anti-KT to see if we see a difference between the boosted and the minimal definitions. Um, so what should happen basically is that they should implement the MJTNS as a clustering jet algorithm to be to do the comparison apple to apple so to say but this is a comparison using the, using the anti-kt which seems to show that there is no difference between the two definitions it would be great if they indeed use the anjetinas as a clustering jet algorithm and compare yeah but sorry the power correction would be uh, much smaller than the one that uh, is like an overall right i agree exactly okay. Okay. yeah not just that i mean there are very other sim simplifications that you get by using the and the uh, the anjetinas one of them is the square root singularities, which would appear if you use the anti-KT jet algorithm, but using the anjetinous subtraction, you can, you, they simply disappear. And the reason is that you can integrate inclusively over um, a piece that appears together with them, which depends on the azimuthal angle. Whereas for the anti-KT, uh, the boundaries of the integral are more complicated because of the constraints from the anti-KT uh, jet algorithm. So you cannot see easily the cancellation of such terms. So there are multiple reasons why using the anti -K the, the anjetinus by itself as a clustering jet algorithm would be much better than the anti-KT. Okay, great, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, more questions? Please, please raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay, I don't, I don't see any more questions. Uh, okay, Lance says that uh, JJ has a question. How do you how do you see this? JJ, do you have a question? Sorry, I misread the uh, raise hand. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay. Um, are there any other questions? Well, I might ask one quick one since. All right. I yeah, sure. Um, there are going to be uh, matrix elements making possible uh, NNLO stuff plus two jets soon. Um, so then work will be need, needed to be done on the soft functions for that, right, Raja? Yeah, that's true. Is that uh, feasible or how long would that take? I mean, feasible, I think it is feasible. It, whether people are ready now to start working on it, that's the, that's, that's the question. I mean, it is feasible. Okay. But if you are asking me, are we working on it right now? <laughs> the answer is no, not yet. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, the virtual corrections are getting close, I think, <laughs> from what we heard in yes. the previous talk. I agree. I don't know, Gerardo can say if they are working on the soft function for the two jets, he can comment on that. <laughs> no, we are not. <laughs> All right, more questions? More questions? All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Raja again. We can thank use you. the reaction button and clap. <laughs>